Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Today we're going to talk about 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 15. Okay. The order, is it order of authority? Or is it simply wearing... If I can grab that. Does it simply mean that it's talking about this? Oh, we want to cover our heads, we want to cover our faces. Is that what this is talking about? Or is it talking about an order of authority? that God has set up for us. So, as you can see, I wrote this down. We're going to get to this in just a second. But turn to 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verse 1, in your King James Bibles. Okay. This is God's perfect written word for English-speaking people. Make sure you can pause the video and turn to the stage. We're going to go through a lot of verses, and then we're going to turn to a few at the end. Okay. Got my coffee, or tea here. I don't really do coffee, but I have my tea here. It looks like I spilled it a little bit. That's what I like about the uh, leather Bibles. Right. Checking my Bible. <laughs> my leather Bible. Uh, it's the leather, the water can be washed off a little bit. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. We're going to go through and we're going to talk about a lot of other verses. We're going to start comparing this list of authority, the order of authority that God has and how the authority goes down and how, how, thing, how we're supposed to be treating each other going up. Okay. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 in your King James Bibles. First it says, Be ye followers of me as I am also of Christ. Now I want to stop there for a second because I was talking to a brother in Christ about this recently. You'll hear a lot of men in ministry will go, my ministry, my ministry, my ministry. And you know why they say my ministry? Because elsewhere in the scriptures, Paul will say, my ministry. And they'll look at Paul and say, well, Paul said my ministry, therefore I can say my ministry. And then I'd sit there and I'd ask him, are you an apostle? No. Was there a special gospel that was revealed to you apart from Paul? No. I mean, you read the Bible, uh, the, uh, the apostles, uh, the tr we call it the transition book, the book of Acts, they're going and starting out by preaching repentance, uh, be water baptism uh, for the remission of sins, and they were preaching that they had crucified their king, and they were trying to still preach the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom. If you repent for crucifying your king and be baptized, God's offering you the kingdom again. They tried to offer the Jewish people the kingdom, but they rejected Jesus Christ all over again. I did this in another study where they rejected their king, God, through Jesus Christ. They rejected God as their king three times in the scriptures. And the fourth time when Jesus comes back for the day of the Lord, which is that thousand year reign, the physical kingdom, they won't be rejecting Jesus Christ again. But when they rejected Jesus Christ again, salvation went out to the world as a whole. Peter had that vision, you know, about all the animals coming down. Now God has made all the animals clean. Okay, but that was his symbolism. I mean, you still can eat any animal as long as you pray over it, and it's not offered unto idols. Okay, you're not, allowed, you're not supposed to be eating food offered unto idols. But you can eat any kind of meat. Okay, God has cleansed all, but it was, uh, it was in type explaining how salvation went out to the world. First salvation is of the Jews in the Old Testament when Jesus was physically walked on, the earth, uh, on this earth. He said salvation is of the Jews. Okay, what happened? After his death, burial, and resurrection, the Jews rejected Jesus Christ as their king a third time. First time in the Old Testament, when they told Samuel, we want a king just like everybody else. They rejected God as their king. That was the first time. Second time is when Jesus Christ was, was in the likeness of sinful flesh. When God came down and manifested in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, he died on the cross. That was them rec uh, rejecting their king the second time. And like I said, the beginning of Acts, Peter and John is going out to them and preaching that kingdom again, that Jesus is their king, that they crucified their king, but he's risen. Accept Jesus now so we can bring in the kingdom of heaven, the, the thousand year reign, the physical kingdom. And they rejected him a third time. All right? Then salvation went out to everybody. Peter had that vision, then God called him to go preach the gospel, to the Gentiles, salvation went out to the world. It was no longer salvations of the Jews, it went out to the world. 
Paul, the gospel was revealed to Paul, was the gospel for today. It's not repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and believe that Jesus is the king, even though we believe he's king, but believe he's the king of the Jews and he's coming down to rule and reign in Jerusalem for a thousand years. That's not the gospel today. The gospel today is repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And after he saves you, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay? You see, I'm really beating around the bush because I really want to drive this home. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. That gospel was revealed to him. Okay? When Paul says, my ministry, look what he said right here. He said, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. What's he saying? Yes, it's my ministry. Yes, it was revealed to me. But it's really Jesus Christ's ministry. I'm actually preaching and I'm part of Jesus Christ's ministry. And Jesus Christ's ministry, the ministry that's for today, that we call the time, we call it the church age, but the Bible calls it the time of the Gentiles, is from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ before that seven year time period called the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? That's, Jesus, that's, that's the ministry that Paul's a part of. And it's salvation that's gone out to the whole world. So when Paul says, my ministry, he's saying Jesus Christ's ministry. He's not saying my ministry like everyone can have their own little separate ministry apart from Jesus Christ's ministry. No. Okay. And people have taken that too far, brother, sister Christ, and they start saying my ministry, my ministry, and next thing you know, you watch some of these men in ministry, whether in the Bible buildings, behind the pulpits, or they're behind the camera, like I am, and, the, uh, and YouTube or any other video platform that you're watching on, okay? They get to the point where, yeah, it's starting to become your ministry because are you straying from Paul's ministry, which is actually Jesus Christ's ministry? That's why I say I'm so blessed to be part of God's ministry. There is no your ministry over here. And you're, we all have different gifts. The Bible talks about, I don't want to get into it too much, but we all have different gifts. God blesses with different uh, talents. That we, can use, that we use to serve God, but we are all part of one ministry. That's why the Bible says we're one body. We're supposed to be striving together. We're all supposed to be of the same mind, the same judgment. Okay? It's one body. It's one ministry. There's not multiple different ministries. Okay? He says it here, Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. My ministry is Jesus Christ's ministry. What I'm telling you here is not my feelings and opinions. It's not my feelings and opinions. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now today, there's no private, no scriptures of any private interpretation today. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself because it's going to talk about praying and prophesying. So I'll wait till we get to that point. But right now, anything I say has to be lined up with this. That's why you're supposed to have the attitude of chapter and verse. That's what I have, chapter and verse. And we live by that because this is our foundation today. There is no anything separate from this. Oh, we can add to this. Oh, we can subtract from this. No, you can't. Not from the Word of God. We have God's perfect written Word today. Okay. Verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. Okay, Paul always talked about how he set the example as you have us for an example. Follow our example. Okay. That's why a lot of times in other studies I'll ask chapter and verse where Paul's doing this. Chapter and verse where... Uh, Peter's doing it. Chapter and verse where John's doing it. Right? Chapter and verse where you know you have Silas, you have Titus, you have Timothy, uh, Barnabas. Okay, you have all these saints in the Old Testament that we can read about in the New Testament, but they, they came from the Old Testament into the New Testament. The trans, you know, getting into it, you can read all about these people. You, we always say, where were they doing it? And people say, well, that's not a good standard. What did we just read here? Remember me in all things. Paul said plenty of times in the scriptures, as you have us for an example. Okay? They set the example that we're to follow, and then we're supposed to be setting that same example, not a new one, that same example for the next generation of Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, the church of God. And then that generation is supposed to be setting the example for the next, and the next, you see how that works? But it all goes back to Paul goes back to the early Christians 
the Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women from the very beginning. They set the example that everyone's to follow down the line. Okay? Remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I have delivered them unto you. This is the way things are. Okay? And we're going to get into that here about that he's saying this is how things are. And there's people we're going to realize today that they fight this. They fight it, they fight it, they fight it. They're not fighting me. They're fighting the Word of God. They're not fighting you, brothers and Christ. They're fighting the Word of God. All right? Verse 3. But I would have you know, this is the, one of the big ordinances that Paul had to push down, I would have you know that the head of every man, here's the word man, that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, there is but one capital G God, the Father. Who's the head of Jesus Christ? Who's the head of the body? The soul, God the Father. Okay. This is the order of authority. It comes down. Remember what Jesus said in the, the garden? He said, not my will, but thy will be done. It's not that they have two separate wills. What he was trying to say is this, his head is God the Father. The soul of the Godhead. That's a whole other study. But God the Father, it's His will that matters. It's His will that's going to be done. Jesus puts God's will first. You think man should be putting God's will first through Jesus Christ? There's one meter between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. Yeah. Okay, the head of everyone is the man and the head of Christ is God. Now I added children down here because we're going to be talking about some things. Who's put over the children? The man and the woman's put over the children. The parents are put over the children. They're, they're the children's head covering, as we're going to get into this study. Okay? And I put Jesus Christ back down at the bottom, because when we get into this study and start talking about it, we're going to find out that it starts, Jesus is the head, and Jesus is the foundation. Jesus is everything. If you did a circle connecting here to here, and here to here, it's one big circle. Jesus is everything. Brothers and Christ, is Jesus everything to you? Well, let's get into this. Okay. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Turn to Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deeds done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, they healed somebody, and they did it in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Remember at the beginning, they were preaching that the man that you crucified, Jesus Christ, he's your king. Like I said, it's a transition book. But notice what they say here. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Okay. The head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And I got a lot of thumbs down on my last study, Brother Jesus Christ, because I pointed out that I just scripture, scripture, scripture. It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. And they're trying to do away with the name Jesus Christ. These, uh, it's supposed to be the Hebrew Roots Movement where they're trying to do away with Jesus Christ, and they're worshiping a man named Joshua, and they refuse to submit themselves to Jesus Christ. Yahashua, Yeshua, that's, Je that's not Jesus Christ. That's Joshua in the Old Testament. All right. But here we have it again. For there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the head of the man. Okay. Are women are supposed to be saved through Jesus Christ? Absolutely. But we're talking about an authority here. Okay, We're not talking about how to get saved. We're talking about an authority here. He's the head. It always starts with Jesus Christ. Okay? The foundation is Jesus Christ. But he's also the head. Okay? He's at the top. He's at the bottom. It's all about Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.20. Turn to Ephesians 2.20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, 
First Corinthians 3.11 says, for, no, for other foundation can no man lay, lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But Ephesians 2.20, where you are in your Bibles, says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He's the foundation. He's the chief cornerstone. He's, chief means the head. He's in charge. He's, he's the boss. He's the most important part of the foundation. He's the chief. Okay? It start, he starts with Jesus Christ and ends with Jesus Christ. He's at the top. He's at the bottom. Okay? That's why I put this here because when we get into it, we're going to be explaining it as you go up and down this, this order that God has set up. This is the order that God has set up. God the Father, through His Son Jesus Christ, when man or woman gets saved, we get the Holy Spirit. Okay, they that have the Spirit of God are His, and they that have not the Spirit of God are none of His. So there's one being between God and man, talk about mankind, the man Christ Jesus. But now the order of authority, that's what this study is about, the order of authority. It's talking about the order of authority here. God the Father, Jesus Christ, man, woman, and I threw in children for this study because I wanted to just go ahead and throw all of it in so we can, this pretty much sums up everyone. You're either a man, husband, woman, wife, or a child. Okay? Whether you have parents or you're an orphan. Okay? They're on the list. Okay? Now we're going to talk about the man for a little bit. 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. We all know this. It's written to a man in ministry. Doctrinally, it's written to a man in ministry. Instruction righteousness is for men and women. But I'm holding this for the man for a second so I can explain something. Okay? So please bear with me. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This has been commanded to a man in ministry. Okay, and why did I show up for a man even though women are supposed to be studying the Word of God too? But I, I mainly push it towards the man because what is the man commanded to do? Okay, might be getting ahead of myself, but the man is commanded to wash his wife by the watering of the Word. She's not supposed to be washing the man in the watering by the Word. The man is supposed to be washing his wife by the watering of the Word. The Bible commands the man, I'm getting ahead of myself again a little bit too, to um, make sure his children are being raised in the admonition of the Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay. He needs to actually study the Word of God. He needs to know it. He can learn from other men in ministry. Okay, Men in ministry, if you're a man that's married, you're not in ministry, you weren't called into full-time ministry, and you can learn from other men in ministry, absolutely. But you're supposed to be making sure that you know the Word of God and that you're passing it down to your wife and your children. John 14.23 John 14.23 Jesus said unto him He's talking to a man. said unto him if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Doctrinally, he's talking to a man. Instruction righteousness, that's for both men and women. But it comes down to the man. The man's supposed to know the word of God, not just know it, he's supposed to be living it. So he can teach his wife how to live it. He can teach his children how to live it. God has a set, which we're going to learn here, God has a set boundary for men. God has a set boundary for women. God has a set boundary for children. And I've talked about this in the past, how when it comes to the man and woman, you draw two circles, and there's a little spot, that, and you bring the circles together where they overlap a little bit. And there's some things that apply to both men and women. There are things in the Bible that apply. We're all supposed to pray. We're all supposed to be reading the Word of God. Well, we just read there, we're all supposed to love Jesus Christ. What's loving Jesus Christ? Keeping His Word. Okay? Keeping His Word. But there's still a lot about a woman boundary that's just for women, and there's a lot about a man's boundary that God says for men that are just for men. Okay? 1 Timothy 5.8 
But if any provide not for his own, if any provide not for his own, it's time of the man. So as for they of his own household, his wife, his children, he is worse than an, uh, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Notice it says provide for his own, even his own household. Okay? Sometimes God can give a man some brothers and sisters in Christ to take care of. You can adopt children. Okay? Uh, you're, let's say, I've, I've heard this happen before, where a man, his sister, her sister's husband dies, and he takes his sister in that has children. Okay? Now, they're not, it's not his wife, it's not his children by blood, but they're brought into his household. So that's what it's talked about there when it says, provide not for his own. It becomes his own, because he takes that upon himself to take care of his sister and his sister's children. Okay? Even, but it says, even those of his own household, your wife, your own blood, your children. Okay? So that's there. Okay. The women are not supposed to be providing for their own and their own household as far as financially and physically, like food and clothing. The Bible talks about a lot of times for men in ministry that you're supposed to be content with food and raiment. Okay? Those are the two best things, food and raiment. And we, we threw in a roof over your head. Okay. The man is supposed to be providing it, not the woman, the man. This is the order of things that God has set up. Okay. 1 Timothy 3, 4. 1 Timothy 3, 4. This is for a bishop. And he's talking, like I said, it's, it's to Timothy, a man that's in ministry. One of the qualifications for a bishop is, and it's for a man, one that ruleth his own house. So even though it's a qualification to become a bishop, this is something that all men are supposed to be doing. Whether you're a bishop or not, whether you want to be a bishop or not, you're all supposed to do your best to qualify, in other words, to say qualify, but if, so you're ready. If God ever called you to be a bishop, you're ready. If God ever called you to be a um, deacon, you're ready. So this, this isn't just for somebody who's a bishop. This is just for a bishop only. It's for the body of Christ as a whole, all the men. Okay. It says here, one that ruleth his own house. Having his children in subjection with all gravity. Ruleth his own house. The order of authority. The man has the authority over the woman and the child. He protects them. He provides for them. He's the one that says, okay, we're doing this this way. Now, before you jump the gun, oh, you're saying the man has all the authority. Who's the head of the man? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ tells him what to do. He tells me what to do. This is how you keep your house. This is how you do things. This is, this is the do's. This is the don'ts. So the man doesn't have all the power and authority. That's feminism, which we're going to get into here in a little bit. That's just feminism, which is the sin of witchcraft. It's, it's people. It's not just women nowadays. There's men pushing feminism. But they're both rebelling against God. Okay? How God set things up here. Okay? But one of the qualifications for a bishop is you're supposed to have your own house, uh, rule your own house well. And I don't want to get into We're going to talk about how things are, and then the Bible talks about what happens when you start messing this up. But right now, we're just talking about how God set it up. The man, Jesus Christ, God the Father, Jesus Christ, His Word comes first, and the man's to obey Jesus Christ. The woman's to obey the man. The children are supposed to obey the mom and the father. The man. And ultimately, the woman obeys Jesus Christ, his words. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. Hopefully we'll get into it if I don't forget. That the woman's supposed to obey the word of God first and foremost, absolutely. That's what I always tell women. You obey God first, your husband second. But a good, we're talking about how God set things up. When you have a good, godly man, and he's following Jesus Christ, and he's following his word, that's what you're supposed to go off of. She's supposed to obey her husband. Okay. We'll talk about it now real quick. Just real quick. What I'm saying here is if you have a woman and a man that are lost, they're married, 
They're both drunkards, drug addicts, and all kinds of wicked things. She gets saved. Born again through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay? She gets all that junk out of her life and says, this is how I'm going to live my life. Are you happy to dwell with me? If he says no, then he's going to leave or she's got to leave because her life is for Jesus Christ right now. If she stays with a man who loves drinking, loves getting high, and all the other wickedness, she's, he's just going to pull her right back down and vice versa. But we're talking about for the woman here. She's to obey God first. That's why I say that for God first, but this is an extreme, okay? These aren't like everyday things. If you're a single woman and you get saved, you wait for a good godly man to get married to. And vice versa, okay? And the Bible says that the man could be won over by the wife, by the words of the wife. I don't do that anymore. I live for Jesus Christ. She doesn't tell her husband what to do. She doesn't absorb the authority of the man. She says, this is how I'm going to live my life for Jesus Christ. Do you want to live this life with me, husband? And if he doesn't, he oftentimes, he'll go. There's the door. He'll go. There's some times where the woman's like, i got to separate myself from him until he makes that decision whether he wants to stay with me or not. And we talked about this in my study of, uh, is it justification for divorce or separation? And we talk about that. That's a whole other side of it. But for how God has it set up for us, brothers and Christ, God the Father has all the authority. He's on top. And Jesus Christ doesn't have a will apart from God. He's just saying God's will comes first. God the Father, the soul. Okay? Man, woman, children. Children are supposed to be obeying the parents. That's why I said they're having children in all subjection with all gravity. Are the children running you? Or are you raising the children in the admonition of the Lord, and you're the one in authority? That's, that's a good question to ask. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.12, when it talks about the deacons, it says, let the deacons be the husband of one wife. In the Old Testament, you saw them getting married to multiple women. That's not for today. Okay? Sometimes you look back and wonder if it was even for then. I don't even think it was then. It just God allowed it to happen sometimes. He still met one man, one woman. That's the true setup. There was Adam, and there was Eve. When he made Adam and help me, he made him one woman, Eve. Okay? It's supposed to be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their, and their own house well. People say, well, it says their own house, ruling the, the children together. They're supposed to be ruling together. No. It says ruling the children. Yes, the parents are supposed to have authority over the children. And the wife is the keeper at home. She takes care of the house. Absolutely. But the husband's the one that's in charge. That's the way God set it up. Okay? And nowadays you've got a lot of feminists that want to fight that. Okay? They want to fight it, want to fight it. Remember Abraham, Sarah calling Abraham my Lord. Sarah the wife calling husband Abraham didn't say that's my husband and we're in equal authority. She's like, that's my husband. And he referred to her not as a husband, but as my Lord. He's the one in charge. He's the one I look to. He's my protector. He prov he's my provider. If we're going to get up and pack up, I look at him and say, okay, where are we going? Like I said, we're not going to hit everything. I'm just going to hit some things to show that this is the order the Bible really pushes, brothers and sisters Christ. Okay. In 1 Corinthians 11, they try to make it out where it has nothing to do with the order of authority, which we're talking about right now. They make it out like it's just some kind of head covering. And that's not what it's talking about, like head covering as far as a hat or something. It's not what it's talking about. Okay. Let's hit the wife a little bit. Ephesians 5.22. Turn to Ephesians 5.22. See, now the husbands, they're responsible for washing the wife by the watering of the word. They're responsible for providing for their wife, uh, raising their children in the admonition of the Lord. And they're responsible for providing for them physically, financially, and we just said spiritually. Washing by the watering of the word. Okay? The husband is supposed to be the protector. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. A good husband can only give his life to a woman that's in subjection to him. It's just that simple. There was a saying someone said that Jesus Christ, God the Father through Jesus Christ, will not save anyone he cannot command. 
If you love me, keep my commandments. If a man love me, keep my words. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Okay, Jesus can't, won't take care of somebody who won't, won't keep his commandments. And I'm test, I live as a testimony to that, brothers of Christ. There's times where I decided, you know what, God, I got this. I'm going off on my own, and I'm going to do my own thing. And God stands there and lets me fall flat on my face, because if you won't listen to me, there's nothing I can do. And he watches me just fall flat on his, my face. Now, you know what he does afterwards? Puts out his hand, grabs me, and picks me back up. When we start saying, hey, God, we're not going to listen to you, God steps back and says, fine, go it on your own and find out what happens. And we wind up falling flat on our face. A man cannot protect a woman if she's going it on her own and doing her own thing. Okay. But a man is supposed to provide physically, financially, and spiritually for the wife and for the children. Right. And, he, and in the end, when push comes to shove, he's supposed to be willing to give his life for his wife. He even lay down his life for his children. Okay. That's the husband. Let's look at the wives. Ephesians 5.22. Wives. Okay. Ephesians 5, chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. To your own husbands as unto the Lord. Salvation. When a woman gets saved, she submits herself to Jesus Christ. Same thing is supposed to be for your husband. Okay. Not that a husband can't save you for eternity, because some of the thought, oh, you're saying that the husband's what saves you? No. Jesus Christ saves you. But in order for Jesus Christ to save anybody, man or woman, you've got to submit yourself to him. You've got to throw all your authority away and your so-called rights and submit yourself to Jesus Christ fully and completely for him to save you. We always talk about the heart. God looks at the heart. If you don't come to him in a repentant state, submitting yourself to Jesus Christ... He won't save you. Right? It's that simple. Why submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife. It's not the other way around. The wife's not supposed to be the head of the husband. The husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church. As a whole. Everybody. Mm -hmm. But we also learn that Jesus Christ is also the head of the man. Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, remember what the woman said as she submitted herself to the Lord? As the church submits themselves to Christ, so is the woman, though so wise, be to their own husbands in everything. Brothers out there, we're supposed to be submitting ourselves to Jesus Christ in everything. Sisters in Christ out there, if you're, if you're married, to a good godly man, you're supposed to be submitting yourself to the man and everything. One of the fallacies you'll hear, I'm getting ahead of myself, is they'll try to use the excuse, well, I don't need a man as a head covering, I've got Jesus Christ as my head covering. But this says that's wrong. The Word of God, not this like me, the Word of God says that's wrong. That's wrong. You're supposed to have a man as a head covering. Jesus is the head covering of the man. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband and everything. 25, I left this here, but husbands, love your wives. Okay? Remember we learned, love is not a feeling, it's an act of your will. True love that a husband has for his wife and children, as he provides for them. Food and raiment. That he's washing his wife by the watering of the word. That he's raising his children in the admonition of the Lord. And like I said, when push comes to shove, he's willing to jump in front of a bullet to save his wife or his children. Husbands love your wives. It's an action. A lot of people today in Hollywood, movies, TV shows, video games, uh, secular, satanic style music, commercials, uh, politics, they make love out to be a flesh feeling, a flesh feeling. No, love is an act of your will. Your actions dictate whether you truly love somebody. Do you really love Jesus Christ? Then what's your attitude towards His perfect written word? Hiding in your heart. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. 
Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Do you truly love Jesus Christ? We just, I just quoted those verses early, but if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him and will come unto him and make our abode with him. Right? True love for Jesus Christ is an action. Are you taking his word, hiding it in your heart, and living it? That's what true love is. True love is an action. Husbands, love your wives. Brothers in Christ out there that are married, are you washing your wife by the watering of the word? Are you raising your children, if you have children, in the admonition of the Lord? Are you providing for them? Are you going without so that they can have clothes and food? I know today we, in America, a lot of families live like kings. They don't know what poverty is that much. They claim we're going through poverty right now, but they really don't know what real poverty is. Not yet. Okay, I don't know how bad it'll get before we get caught up over Jesus Christ, but it could get bad. But the point is, is that's what true love is. Husbands, love your wives. He says, Christ also loved the church. And here's the definition of how Christ loved the church. And gave himself for it. It was an action. Jesus could have said, well, I love the church. And then when it says, okay, it's time for the cross, he could have been like, and take off the other direction. I'm not saying he never would, but I'm just saying, is that love? No, it isn't. What was the love when he actually was nailed to the cross? When he was whipped and beaten, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. What he physically went through, the action, was proof that how he loved the world at one time. And for those who get saved, that's proof of his love for you. It's an action that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing and watering of the word. That's what you're supposed to, the husbands are supposed to wash, because as Christ did for the church, Christ is washing the church by the watering of the word. The husband's supposed to be doing that for his wife and his, son, and his children. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 14.34. Turn to 1 Corinthians 14.34. Let your women keep silent in the churches. Now, a great brother in Christ did a great study on this. It's not talking about how they can't sing or they can't pray. What it's talking about is they're not supposed to be up there preaching and teaching the word as a whole. They're allowed, the women, elder women are allowed to teach the younger women good things, and it lists out those good things. Okay, being a good keeper at home, how to love your husband. Okay, being subjected to him that the word of God be not blasphemed. Obey him in all things that the word of God be not blasphemed. Okay? How to be chaste. How to have a meek and quiet spirit. These are things that the elder women can teach the younger women, but what it's talking about is when the whole church comes together, men and women, okay, they're not supposed to be speaking. They're supposed to be silent. Okay? For it is not permitted unto them to speak. They can sing hymn. They can sing hymns with everybody. They can bow their head and pray. Okay? But they're not supposed to be up there being, you know, there's no such thing as a woman preacher. No woman bishops, no women deacons, uh, no women um, preachers and teachers when it comes to as a whole. Okay? There is, like I said, there is a boundary that God sets that women are allowed to preach and teach in. And it has to do with those things that I just mentioned. But they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. Under obedience. Under the man. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. I want to throw that in there because it shows an order of authority. Let them ask their husbands at home. Their husbands are supposed to be washing their wives by the watering of the word. All right. Can a wife, can a woman learn from other, like men in ministry, like this ministry, right? Uh, God's ministry, let me be part of the God's ministry. Can you learn from men that have been called into preaching and teaching? Absolutely women can. But when, when it comes to a church setting, where the whole body of Christ comes together, if you have questions, you would ask your husband at home. Right? You say, well, you don't have a husband. Then you ask your say, father, father. 
You ask the eldest uh, man in the family that's saved. And you ask them questions about the Word of God and the teaching that was talked about that day. Okay? That's just the way it's set up. And worst case scenario, let's say you have nobody, then you can ask the preacher after the session's over, the Bible's te teaching is over, the Bible preaching is over, you can ask the pastor afterwards. Okay? If you don't have that head covering, and that pastor ends up taking on as a head covering, there might be some elder men in the church that take on the responsibility of being head coverings for women. Paul, ta or Paul uh, Peter, they came to him when there was widows that were, weren't being taken care of and being ignored. And they set up some men to be head coverings for those widows. You can set up some elders in the church to be head coverings for women that don't have head coverings. Okay? This is how God set it up, and this is how we're supposed to be doing things. Is this being done today? No. Okay? Even pro among professing Christians, Bible-believing, God-fearing, is this how things are being going? No. It's very messed up today. We're in the last days, brothers and Christ, but this is how it's supposed to be, according to God's Word. Uh, turn to 1 Peter 3.1. 1 Peter 3, 1 says, Likewise, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Wives, be in subjection to your own husband. That, if any obey not the word, so I'm talking about a husband that's lost, that any obey not, or a husband that's saved that starts going the wrong direction, you know, like he's stumbling, he's falling, he's starting to turn his back on the Word of God. So just be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the Word, they also may without the Word be won by the conversations of the wives. There's a difference between having a conversation, sisters in Christ, and then tell, and, and there's a difference between having a conversation with your husband, and then turning around, there's a difference between that, and then ordering your husband what to do. And telling your husband what to do. That's not what this is saying. You tell your husband what he's doing is wrong and he better stop. No. You have a conversation. Honey, what does the word of God say about what you're doing? I'm going to keep praying for you. I want, for like a saved woman that's married to, uh, to a lost man. I'm going to keep praying for you. I praise the Lord in all things. You give God glory in all things. You give Him thanks in all things. And he sees that you have something that he doesn't have. True peace. Your husband, the, the wife, you have something that that lost husband doesn't have. Jesus Christ, but with, through, through Jesus Christ, you have real peace. You have real joy. You're not given a spirit of fear. He might be flipping out about what's going on in the world or what's going on in your lives, like hard times, and you're all peaceful because you trust the Lord. And you know, no matter how bad it gets, if God says, hey, it's time for you to come home, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I know where I'm going when I die, and I look forward to it. He might be won over by the conversation, but won by the conversation of the wise. That conversation isn't you telling him what to do. Right? That's not it. Okay? Your conversation is being chaste, having a meek and quiet spirit, and you stand for the truth in a loving way. I'm going to pray for you, honey. Talk about your husband. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to keep praying for you. This is how I'm living. I'm living for the Lord every day. My life belongs to Him. What does God's Word say about that? What does God's Word say about that? You're just trying to get Him to remember what God's Word says. For someone who's saved, you're married to a saved man, and he's kind of like stumbling, and he's not doing what's right according to the Scriptures. He's starting to fall back into bad habits. Old ways. Okay. The conversation of the wives. Verse 2. Why they behold your chaste, here's the conversation, chaste conversations coupled with fear. Now what's that fear? We just said it's not the fear of the world. For we've not given the spirit of fear, but of uh, power, love, and a sound mind. So what's this fear? It's not of the world. What's this fear? If they'll see your fear of God. Your chaste conversation and your fear of God. Why won't you do this? Because God, I fear God. I won't do that because I'm trying to please my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that doesn't please my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's when it comes back down to what I said. Jesus and His Word comes first even for the wife. Okay. Jesus comes first. 
But this is set up, when Paul's talking about this order of authority, it's set up for like having a 100% saved man. If you have a lost man that's willing to live the way that you're living for Jesus Christ, you're still to submit yourself to him. Right? Those are the two situations. You have a saved man that loves the Lord and loves his word, you submit yourself to him. You have a lost man that's willing to live the way that you're living for the Lord, living God's way, but he's living your way. He's not doing it for God, he's doing it for you. And you might be able to win him to Jesus Christ. Right? But when they don't want to, they're lost, and they don't want anything to do with the way you're living, they're going to end up going their own way. You're going to end up have to separate. That's why I've seen it so many times. But it says here, the conversation which beholds your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, and of wearing gold, or putting on apparel. The outward appearance, is in other words. That's all it's talking about. It's not supposed to be the outward appearance. Okay, you know what the number one thing the feminists use, that women try to use to get men to submit to them as authority, instead of them submitting to them? They use seduction. They use the flesh. They use the outward appearance. He says, Whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating of hair, and wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, Jesus Christ. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. You're not supposed to be out there hollering with the men. You're not out there yelling at your husband. You're not out there yelling at your children. You're not out there trying to yell and holler, and I'm going to... Picket this, and I'm going to picket that. You know how you get those people that are, um, they have their signs out there, and they're waving them and everything. Protesters. Women are not supposed to be out there protesting and screaming at the top of their lungs along with all the other men. No, they're not. No, they're not. It's the hidden man of the heart. It's how they reach people. How the sisters in Christ reach people. It's the hidden man of the heart. Do you love the Lord? Sisters in Christ, do you love the Lord? Are you doing things His way? Hiding His word in your heart and you're living it? And one of the commands is, this is the order of authority. Man's supposed to be a head over the wife. But let it be the hidden man of the heart that is which, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. A good godly woman that's willing to stay in this order of authority as God commanded, her worth is like in more than all the, I think it's the rubies, uh, precious rubies in the world. I always say this to brothers in Christ, is if you find a good godly woman, according to the scriptures, right, her, she's worth more than all the precious stones, all the gold, all the silver, and all this world. That's how hard it is to find one today. Are you out there, brothers sisters, or, I mean, sisters in Christ? Are you out there? Yes. Brother, brothers, are they out there? Absolutely. But there's few of them. Just as there's few of us as a whole, the body of Christ today, that's still standing for the Word of God. Compared to the population of the world, there's very few of us. Very, very few of us. Right. The sight of God of great price. A woman that's staying within the boundaries that God has set for her is a woman of great price in God's eyes. Not just the man's eyes. I didn't write this first down, but like the Old Testament, I think it was, uh, I can't remember if it was Solomon. But they're saying her price is, or it could have been King David. Her price is far above, like in the Psalms, her price is far above rubies. It's not just saying that man's, how man sees a good godly woman and her worth. This is saying how God views her. The sight of God of great price. But today you got women that don't want to be in the boundary that God set for them. Right. Verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God, the hidden man of the heart, as you have submitted yourself to Jesus Christ, also submit yourself to your husbands. Here we go talking about... For after this matter in old times, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. Now listen, it's not saying the plating of the hair. It's not talking about 
Clothing. How do we know this? Right here. They adorn themselves. We just got finished. This doesn't contradict. God just got finished showing us that it's not the plating of the hair, it's not the clothes, it's not the makeup. You know, the flesh. They adorn themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. So what's the adorning that the Bible's talking about? The man. A woman's adorning is the man. It's not supposed to be the plated hair. It's not the makeup. It's not the, the clothes that you wear, sisters in Christ. It's the man. You have the hidden man of the heart. You're supposed to have some kind of a man and authority over you, whether it's a husband, a saved father, the eldest saved man in the uh, eldest man in the in your household, preferably being saved. Okay, some elders in the church could be even the preacher. Okay, but you're supposed to have this right here as an adorning, a man. being subject to their own husbands. Verse 6, even as Sarah also obeying, obeyed Abraham, obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. You know, you know the Old Testament, you know, I believe he failed, he, I believe he screwed up, but you had Abraham telling Sarah, tell, when they went into Egypt, tell me you're my sister. I don't believe he should have done that. He got too scared, didn't trust God, and he feared the people over fearing God. He screwed up. But guess what? Sarah did it. And God didn't hold her accountable. God hold, held um, Abraham accountable. Okay. But the, as, a, as Sarah obeying Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter she you are. Are you a daughter of Jesus Christ? We're all now, now are we the sons of God? We're all children of God? Where's your adorning? That's what this verse, we're going to get back to 1 Corinthians. Okay, 1 Corinthians 11. That's what it's talking about when it talks about head covering. The head of every uh, man is Christ. The head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God the Father. It's talking about adorning your authority. Who's an authority? I'm not my own authority. Sisters in Christ that are very into feminism or really struggling with feminism, I'm not my own authority. I don't have all this power and can tell whatever I want to do. No, Jesus Christ is my authority. He tells me what to do okay, through his word. But we see there that there's a chain of authority. God the Father through Jesus Christ to the man, to the woman, to the children. And we already said this. Adorning is not talking about physical, but spiritual. It's talking about having the man spiritually as your head covering when it says adorning in that passage. And what about the children? I threw children on here just because I wanted to bring up the whole family, the whole family atmosphere as far as how God designed the family to be. This is how God designed the family to be. Right? This is the order of authority in the family. What about the children? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Ye fathers... Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There's the verse where we get that from. What it means by not, um, Father, uh, what does it say? And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. If you, one of the things we're taught in the Bible, and some men still have a hard time getting this, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. You know how you provoke your children to wrath? Correct them out of anger. They see you get angry, then they get angry, thinking it's, that's the way it's supposed to be. You can be angry with a cause, but you're not supposed to correct anybody out of anger. Okay? Uh, when there's discipline, I've always told this as advice to, to parents, to children, you should never, ever discipline your child when you're angry. Take a walk. 
Talk with the Lord. Pray. Talk with the Lord. Let that anger cool down. Give that anger to the Lord. Yes, your child was probably 100% wrong in what they did, but calm down to enough that you can discipline your child out of love the way Jesus Christ disciplines us out of love, the chastening of the Lord. He does it out of love. When you discipline somebody, you do it out of love. You're wanting to build them back up. Sometimes you've got to chip away and break the bad stuff down so you can build them back up as a good thing. Okay? But when you start losing your temper, you start doing it out of bitterness, out of hate, out of envy, you're just destroying the person, period. You're not building them back up. Right? Same thing goes with the children. Okay? And when you raise them in the admonition of the Lord, which also can give them to wrath, is if when you teach your child, you don't teach your child that stealing is wrong. You teach your child that God says stealing is wrong. Right? So on and so forth. You, bring God, you make God the foundation. This is the foundation of our home. God's Word. Right? But you can uh, provoke your children to wrath. There's another way you can do it. When you don't set the right example. Mothers, fathers. When you don't set the right example, how many times have you heard this? Do as I say, not as I do. Uh, that's not how it's supposed to be. Yes, there's some things that you can do as an adult that a child can't do. You tell them, someday when you get older, you'll be able to do these things. But right now, you're not allowed to do them. But you're not to have the attitude of do as I say and not as I do. You're supposed to be an example for the children. Mothers and fathers, you're supposed to be an example for your child to live up to. It used to be the sons wanted to grow up to be like their dads. Today, that's gone almost. Just completely gone. In the past, it used to be the women, the daughters, wanted to grow up to be like their mothers. They wanted to be keepers at home. They wanted to get married. They wanted to bear children. They wanted children. That's why they played house. The little girls used to play house. Do you guys remember that? They would play house. How to be wife, you have the husband that comes home and the wife that's there being a good keeper at home. You have the children. That's what little girls used to play with, dolls. They grew up wanting to be like their mom someday because they're setting the example. That's what you're supposed to do, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're married and have children. Is set the example. Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. Turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Children, obey your parents in all things. This is the order of things. Parents are to obey their The children are supposed to obey their parents and be raised in the admonition of the Lord. Wives are to obey their husbands. And the husbands are supposed to make sure she's watered in the watering by the word. Husbands are supposed to be under the authority of Jesus Christ, and they're supposed to be studying God's Word and living it, hiding it in their heart and living it. It goes up that way, and it, order of authority comes down that way. Jesus Christ has authority over all three. God the Father has authority over everything. Jesus Christ has authority over the man, woman, and child. Man has the authority over the women and the children. The women have the authority over the children. This is the way of things. This is the Bible way. What's happened today? It's gotten destroyed, Brother Jesus Christ. It's gotten utterly destroyed. What happens when the order of authority is messed up? Go back to 1 Corinthians, because that's what people don't get. 1 Corinthians 11, we read uh, verses 1 through 3, but verse 3 says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every man is Jesus Christ. The head of the woman is the man. And the head of Jesus Christ is God. It's saying, this is the order God set things up. And we'll explain why. Okay, we're going to get into this. Why? I know this is a long video. Please bear with me. Why is it like this? Okay, but that's what it's saying in that first verse. This is how God set it up. Then it goes into, now let me show you what happens when people go against that order. They think they know better. Okay? I know better than God, and I'm going to do things my way, and I'm not going to do things God's way. So 1 Corinthians 11.4. He just got finished saying, this is the order of things. 
Now what happens when someone messes up this order? 1 Corinthians 11.4 Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered. Remember, the head of every man is Jesus Christ. But the woman is supposed to adorn herself with the man. The woman is supposed to have the head covering of, G of a man. Now when that man doesn't have Jesus Christ as a head covering, he dishonoreth his head. That's what it's talking about. It just said the head of every man is Jesus Christ. This is supposed to be your final authority, men, brothers, brothers in Christ out there. All the lost men out there, they dishonor their heads. What do they need to do? They need to get saved. They need to get born again. But for brothers out, this video is for brothers in Christ out there that are born again and saved by Jesus Christ. When you start straying from, thus saith the Lord, and you start going off of the three enemies, well, the lust of the flesh, the world, well, they've always done it. We always have done it. A little bit don't hurt. We know when to quit. You know, all those excuses. When you start straying from Jesus Christ being your head covering, you dishonor your head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesies with her head uncovered, remember what it said, what's the head of the woman? The husband. Every man that prays or prophesies having his head covered, talking about the woman, he has his head covered by the woman. We're going to talk about this also. This verse is talking about how the children can come into it and start taking over the man. Where the woman and the children rule over him. When he has these people down here, a wife or the children as a head covering, and not Jesus Christ, he dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered, they don't have a man in authority. They don't have a man that's a, a, as an adorning for him. Dishonoreth her head. That even all as if she were shaven. And this is where we get into the confusion. Because they think the covering is talking about hats. It's talking about hats that you put on your head. No, it isn't. What's it doing? It's going to go through and show what it's like to have these two, the man and the woman, switch places. This is how it's supposed to be. This is the order of authority. Now the Bible's going to say, okay, let's let into it with they switch places. Where the woman is the head covering for the man. And the woman doesn't have a head covering. Now we're going to go into it. Okay, that's what's going on here. As if she were shaven. Jesus is not the head covering of the man. The man has a woman as a head covering instead. Or the child. Because like I said, sometimes the children can rule over the man. Right? The man or the woman, or the woman or the child becomes the head covering of the man. Right? When the man's not the head covering of the woman. Okay. That's what it's talking about. It's switching these places around. Okay. Parents aren't the head covering of the children. 1 Corinthians 11, 6. Let's keep going. For if the woman be not covered, let, it, let her also be shorn. And we're going to get into this. So let's shorn talk about physically shaving her head. And we'll get into this. Let her also be shorn, but if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, shaving her head completely, let her be covered. It's not talking about a physical head covering, it's talking about a man. You're to have a man as a head covering, and if you refuse to have a man as a head covering, this is the punishment. We're going to shave your head. And when you're out in public, it used to be when you're out in public as a woman, if you didn't have long hair, you were ashamed. It's a punishment. They were trying to shame you into getting back under a head covering. A man. That's what this is talking about. Some people say, oh, no, no, it's talking about actual physical. No, it isn't. The only physical head cover is talking about is a man. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. And it is a shame. It's motivation to get the women to do what's right. Physical head shaved to dishonor her or she can submit to a man in authority over her. Let her be covered. That's what it's talking about here. But what happens? They should be ashamed. They dishonor their heads. When a, when a man doesn't have Jesus Christ as his head covering, it's the wife or the, or the children, 
he dishonoreth his head. If the wife doesn't have the man as a head covering, but she tries to be her own head covering, in other words, she doesn't have one, she dishonoreth her head. 1 Corinthians 11, 7. For a, mean, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. He's talking about not covering, having a woman as a head covering. His head covering is supposed to be Jesus Christ, not the woman. That's what it's talking about here. But the woman is of the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Can't you see what it's saying, brothers and sisters Christ? It's saying that when a woman switches places here with the man and tries to be the head covering of the man, it's saying the man wasn't created for the woman, but the woman for the man. This is wrong. This is sin. It's feminism. When a woman rebels against God and says, I don't want to have a man as my head covering, I'm going to claim you as my head covering, and, just, and what I'm really saying is I'm my own head covering. Notice it doesn't work when you claim Jesus Christ as your head covering, because it says the head of every man is Jesus Christ. But when it goes into actual head covering, a man's not to have a head covering. That term head covering is just for the women. The woman's supposed to have the man as a head covering. Man, Jesus Christ is supposed to be the head of the man. You see how that works? Oh yeah. Now, we see here though, when he talks about this for the man, for the woman, this is how we get the reason. Why did God say it's God first, Jesus, man, then woman? Why did he say man first, then woman when it comes to authority? Why? Because the woman was made for the man. We're going to get into this. Okay, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Two reasons. Order of, of creation, and Eve was uh, deceived, not Adam. Okay? The fact that Eve was deceived, it's part of her punishment, and that the order of creation, those are the two reasons. It has nothing to do with culture, has nothing to do with man deserves to be supreme. Ha it's how God set it up. God's the one who says it, not me. Second, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp the authority over the man. Remember, she's supposed to be silent in the church. She's not supposed to be teaching nor usurping the authority over the man, but to be in silence. It's talking about the church in a church setting. Right? When the body of Christ comes together. Uh, verse 13. For Adam was first formed. This is why. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. There's your two reasons. Adam was created first, then the woman. Adam wasn't deceived. Eve was. 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in the faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Childbearing. Okay. You know what saves a lot of women in these last days? You know what's going to save a woman from feminism? Is they get married to a good godly man and they bear children. Keepers at home, raising the children in the admonition of the Lord. Staying busy around the house. That's what's going to protect them. Today, I'm, I'm, we're talking about what messes this up. Today, this whole order gets messed up. It gets completely messed up. It gets turned around. So where are we at? Okay, two reasons for the order of authority. Man being... Man and woman is because order of creation. I lost my place. Free of me, brother. Said. Order of creation and being deceived. Genesis 3.16. If you want to turn to Genesis 3.16, we read. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow on thy conception. This is Eve's punishment. Adam's was that he'd have to till the ground. 
from whence he came. Remember what a man's supposed to be? He's supposed to provide for his wife physically, financially, and spiritually. Wife and children. Her punishment. And sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. So now when you are with child, it's not pregnant, it's with child, there's going to be pain when it comes to birth, birthing a child. But the Bible talks about after the child's born, the woman forgets the pain and all she has is joy. When she's holding her, her daughter or her son and her baby in her, in her arms. Right. But one of her punishments was is that it's going to be painful. Here's the other punishment. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Right. Remember, the husband's not the final authority. I'm not my own final authority. People see that so men can just rule. You know how they always try to break things and they try to manipulate it and make it look certain. I have an authority that I have to follow. I'm not my own authority. You know who's the ultimate authority? Jesus Christ. Through God the Father, through His Son, Jesus Christ. But it says here that she shall rule over thee. That's why this order was set up by God. Order of creation, and that Eve was deceived, not Adam. Right. Turn it back to 1 Corinthians 11.10. 1 Corinthians 11.10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. You know what the power on her head is? Right there. The feminists hate that. The feminists just flat out hate that. Right there. What's this talk about because of the angels? Well, you go back to the Old Testament before the flood... What happened? You had angels that left their first estate and came down here. They'd sinned against God by leaving heaven and coming down here, and they saw women that didn't have head coverings. Daughters of men. They didn't have head coverings to protect them. And it says that they took these women and made them their wives. They took wives of the women. Right? If they were married, they wouldn't have gotten... Take the ones that were married, I believe, in the Old Testament before the angels came down. The angels didn't mess with women that were married. They messed with the single women that had no head covering. They didn't have power on their head to protect them. Right. Same thing goes on today, brother says Christ. Satan is, people forget this, Satan is a fallen cherub. Okay, he's not a fallen angel, he's a fallen cherub. Jesus Christ in the Old Testament is referred to as the angel of the Lord. An angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. So what does Satan do? He's trying to copy Jesus Christ. So the Bible says he transforms himself into an angel of light. And no marvel, for his ministers also transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And these men that transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness and Satan pretending to be an angel of light, because he's not, he deceives women that don't have power on their head. And women today have been greatly deceived and they're really messed up in the world today. Uh, Genesis 6.2 is where it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. They took them and then married them and made them their wives. In other words, they didn't have husbands. Okay, so I'm not just making that up. There's something about a, a woman without a head covering that tempts the angels, that tempts the ministers of righteousness. They transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness, but they're servants of Satan that tempts them, they go after women with no head covering. And today, that's pretty much like, I want to say 99% of the world today, they don't have head coverings. Not like how God set it up. They might be married, but they don't have a head covering. I know I'm exaggerating, I'm hoping it's more like 80%, but it, sometimes it feels like it's 90 to 99%. Okay? And that's the way Satan likes it. That's the way Satan's ministers like it, because they're easier to deceive. Right? I always tell people this, my, my dad, my grandfather, I'm sorry, my grandfather, I want to believe he's saved. I've got his Bible, I've used it in some Bible, t when I used to do Bible by the pond, before I had to move the pond on the deck, I was reading from my grandfather's Bible. My grandfather's passed away now. But my grandfather was, was the head covering of my grandmother. And he was charged with protecting her. 
Okay. Um, he got he, he retired 20 years in the military, and then he did another 20 year retirement from the post office. And once the children grew up, and I'm not justifying this, but when the children grew up and left the house, this is what they did. She got a job at the post office and did her 15 to 20 years, and they both retired from the post office together. And he, he told us this story that while they were working at the post office, he was sitting there, and I think it was the break room or something, and his wife was talking about these girls over here, these other women, that were trying to talk her into going and hanging out with them. Like Saturday night, Friday night, go hang out with the women. They, later on, he found out, she found out, they wanted to go to the bars and hang out. But before any of that happened, he looked at her and said, you're to stay away from those women. Those women are dangerous. They're no good. You need to stay away from them. And praise God, my grandmother listened to my grandfather. Come to find out those women were stepping out on their husbands. And they were going to the bars and hanging out and having a good time. But my grandmother had no head covering. My grandfather, she would have went with them. She would have went with them, got all kinds of messed up, done things that she normally wouldn't do. Okay? Head covering. They go after women that don't have head coverings, for the most part. Right? And when you do have a head covering, you've got a man to say, no, you're not doing that. No, you're not going out with those girls and getting drunk and having a good time. Second Corinthians 11, 13 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no, no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Right, that's where I got that verse from. Right. 2 Timothy 3.1 this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. They're not going to be head coverings, good head coverings. It's all going to be about the man by himself. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, coaches, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. There's a big movement now that men are saying just stay single. Don't be a head covering for any woman. Do we see that going on hardcore today? Even men that are married aren't head coverings for their wives. They're not doing what's right according to God's word. But more than anything without natural affection is talking about sodomites. But you have men that aren't, being, that aren't getting married. Okay. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasures, and if they truly love Jesus Christ and he's the head of the man, he's going to make sure that taking care of these two is his top priority. But nowadays you see men that their top priority is, is making themselves feel good. Doing what's best for them. They're not making self-sacrifices for their family. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they, for this sort, talking about the men, those types of men, for this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, Diverse lusts. They don't have a head covering. I'm my own boss. I can do whatever I want. Me, 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 I, I, I. I can cut my hair short. I can wear pants. I can have my own career. And in this day and age, I can have abortion. I can kill my unborn child. And so on and so forth. Led away with diverse lusts. Laden with sins. Drunkenness. Drug addicts. All kinds of things. But more importantly, they've been taught that women are their own head covering and you can do whatever you want to do. And when you get men that follow onto this list, 
that we just read here, they come and deceive these women and lead them completely astray. Why? Because they don't have a proper head covering. They're not adorned properly with a godly man. For of this sort of they which creep into houses and lead captive silly wood and laid with sin, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now these men are that way? Absolutely. But the women are that way too. I've talked to them about these verses we're going over right now. They have nothing to do with the head covering. They have, as far as a, a hat or a face, I had a woman yell at me, saying, you're wearing a hat when I was outdoors. I'm wearing a hat because it's, it's the sunny, whether it's the cap because it's sunny, or it's the black hat because it's cold outside, or if it gets cold in the house because my wood stove broke down, but, not wood stove, uh, pellet stove broke down. So I, had, I was wearing this in a lot of videos indoors <laughs> because it was cold in the house. Oh, I'm not allowed to wear a hat. That's a head covering. I'm not supposed to be praying, uh, doing Bible studies. Bible, the, the verses say pray or prophesying. But they like to add Bible studies. But what's going on with these women? When I try to tell them the truth and try to show them the truth, they have the attitude of ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. I taught myself. I know better. Yeah, we just read how if a woman has questions, she's to ask her husband at home. We just read, read, read verses how the husband's to wash his wife by the watering of the word. All this talking is making it fall off. But... Uh, the husband is supposed to wash his wife by the watering of the word and raise his children in the admonition of the Lord. They're to learn from their husband, the man of the house. You ever heard that saying, the man of the house? Today it's a bad saying. According to the Bible, it's a good saying. There are men and women that are messed up spiritually having a professing of faith out there in the world. So you have all these professing Christians out there, and they're really messed up. And one of the reasons I believe they're messed up is because they don't follow this order right here that God has set up for them. And someone comes along and messes up the women. You know, tick, uh, have, uh, having teachers, having itching ears, they've had men come by and tell them what they want to hear. Not telling them what they need to hear, but what they want to hear. Oh, you don't need a man as a head covering. you got Jesus Christ. Yet Jesus Christ himself is telling us through his word, you need a man as a head covering. See how they tell you the opposite? But they tell them what they want to hear. All right. God the Father through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Okay. God the Father through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. You have the man, woman, child in that order. That's how God set it up. 1 Corinthians 11, 11 says, neither, neither, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man, in the Lord. There was a teaching I had a brother in Christ who says, uh, you can't have a Proverbs 31 woman without having a Proverbs 31 man. He was only half right. The half that he left out, I believe, is because he was married and trying to please his wife. Okay. Uh -huh. Because honestly, if you read Proverbs, you can't have a Proverbs 31 man without having a Proverbs 31 woman. You can't have a Proverbs 31 woman without having a Proverbs 31 man. They both have to be in line with this and how God has set up the boundaries of the man and his responsibilities, the boundaries of the woman and her responsibilities. A man in authority over the woman, Jesus Christ in authority over the man. All this has to work this way, brother, says Christ in order for it to work. That's what this verse is saying. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man, in the Lord. If you're doing it the Lord's way, it takes the man and the woman to do things the Lord's way. When you have a husband and you have a wife, for the marriage to work, for the marriage to be successful, you both have to be in the Lord and you have to be doing it the Lord's way. It's that simple. Remember what it says about the woman, about uh, that she causes the word of God to be blasphemed when she doesn't obey her husband? Well, the church as a whole is supposed to obey Jesus Christ. We are meant to be a family working together. Key words here in 1 Corinthians 11, 11 is in the Lord. We're supposed to be working together as a body of Christ in the Lord. 
The husband and the wife are supposed to be working together, but he's still the authority. Doesn't mean he's not the authority, but they're supposed to be working together in the Lord. They're supposed to be doing things God's way. God says this is the boundaries for the women, what she's supposed to be doing and how she's supposed to be, how she's supposed to look. Long hair, modest dresses, short hair. Okay. And he's not allowed to wear men's apparel. He's responsible for taking care of these two, physically, financially, spiritually. The wife is to help raise the children in the admonition of the Lord. But she's to be a keeper at home. She's to love her husband, bear the children, raise the children. Have a meek and quiet spirit. Be chaste. You see how that goes? He's supposed to love his wife as, as, God, as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. They go hand in hand, Brother Strath. This works together. You can't have a Proverbs 31 man without a Proverbs 31 woman. Period. And on the flip side, you can't have a Proverbs 31 woman without a Proverbs 31 man. A good example is this. If you have a Proverbs 31 woman marry a man that's not a Proverbs 31 man, guess what? She's going to stop being a Proverbs 31 woman. You have a Proverbs 31 man who marries a woman that's not a Proverbs 31 woman. What's going to happen? He's going to slowly over time stop being a Proverbs 31 man. They go hand in hand. That's why when you get married, you're one flesh. Okay. 1 Corinthians 11, 12. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. Not of the woman, by the woman. But all things are of God. Okay. Are you in Christ Jesus our Lord? 13. Judge in yourselves, it is calmly that a woman pray unto God uncovered. Once again, it's taught by the man. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? What it's talking about here, let me keep going, shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Okay. The covering it's talked about here is two coverings. The length of one's hair and a man and a woman. It's taken the man that's supposed to have short hair, if you switch him down to here and say, okay, now he's down here, and the woman's his head covering, he's acting like a woman. He's acting like he has long hair. And the woman gets bumped up to here is as if she was cutting her hair short. She's acting like a man. She's leaving the woman's boundary to go into the man's boundary. And the best way that God knew how to show it to us was women have long hair, men have short hair. What happens when you reverse that? You're messing everything up. If today, I mean, honestly, brothers and sisters, you look out there today, it should be common knowledge, okay? Men have short hair, women have long hair. But today it's all messed up. But you go back, not even 100 years, but you can say 100 to 100 years ago, for thousands of years before that, it was common knowledge. Women had long hair, hair down to the shoulders or longer, and men had short hair, hair that didn't even get close to the shoulders. Men have short hair, women have long hair. That was a distinction between the two. It's just common sense. Not today. Not today. It's not common sense at all today. Why? Because they've messed all this up. They got women trying to be men. You got women trying to be their own head coming. They're trying to be a man. They're wearing pants. They're cutting their hair short. They're getting their own careers. I'm a career woman. They're their own boss. Okay. That's what this is talking about here. It's not talking about this. It's talking about it's normal that a man has short hair. But when a man lets a woman be an authority over him, it's as if he's acting like the woman and he's got the long hair. Because women are supposed to have long hair. You're acting like a, a, uh, you're acting like a woman with long hair when you let a woman be your authority. And a woman, when she jumps up there and tries to jump up and be the authority of a man, be her own head covering, she's likened to acting like a man with short hair. That's all this is talking about, brothers and sisters Christ. It's talking about switching the order of authority. That's all that's talking about there. It's not talking about this. It's not this thing where we can agree to disagree on head coverings. This is something we can't agree to disagree on. We have to agree to agree. This is God's order, and this is what we need to do our best to abide by. Okay? 
1 Corinthians 11, 6, 16, you get, But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such customs, neither the churches of God. You know what that part's talking about? It goes back to what it's talking about shaving the woman's head as a punishment, to shame her. You know when the Bible talks about whose glory is in their um, shame? Whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things? They glorify their shame. Today, if you had a woman shave her head, as short as mine, she'd be glorifying it. Praise the Lord. Not praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord. You say praise the Lord. But they'd be out there going, yeah, this is great. Oh, good times, good times. And they'd just be out there. I, I have a hard time going into town, you know, seeing all, not just the women, but the men, okay? It's just you see these people, they're glorifying and they're shamed. But in our specific study that we're doing right now, for the women, the women having long hair, or cutting, I'm sorry, cutting their hair short. There's men in town that have super long hair and they're glorifying in it. Like, this is great, man. This is awesome. It's not. All right? That's, that's them defi uh, being defiant against God. They're being defiant against this order. And God's given us an example. That's all it's talking about, brothers and Christ. All right? But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no cu such custom, neither the churches of God. In other words... If she wants to rebel against God and she wants to do her own thing, the Bible says, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. Okay? It talks about putting them out in your fellowship. Today, we don't have to do physical shaving their head to try to shame them. We just say, I'm sorry, I can't have anything to do with you. If you want to be a feminist up here, I can't have anything to do with you. Right? You need to get your heart right with God so I can invite you back into our fellowship if it's a sister in Christ. If it's a lost woman, family or not, you can talk to them, but you don't fellowship. You don't have any fellowship with the lost world. Right? He's saying we have no such custom. There's no command of God saying that she's going to be stubborn and she's going to be hardcore feminist. Her head has to be shaved. We have no such custom. And remember what it said, if it's a shame, and it should be, if it's a shame for her to have her head shaved, let her be covered. It's talking about a man. But they prefer this. Anything to get away from that man being an authority over them, they prefer this. And this is what they always try to go back to. This is talking about physical cats and kid coverings. No, it is not. It's talking about the man. And that one passage, that few verses we just read there, it's talking about them switching places. Ruining all this. Right. Remember 1 Corinthians 11, 5 says, But if every woman that prayeth and prophesieth with her head and covereth the sound of her head, for that is even as one if she were shaven. That's what we're getting this from. When you get down to 11, 1 Corinthians 11, 16, Go back to 1 Corinthians 11, 5, where it says, But every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered to sound her head, for that is even as one if she were shaven. She's acting like the man. She's not, the short hair. That's, a, that's supposed to be a physical attribute of a man, not a woman. Short hair. Right? For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. She doesn't have a man as a head covering, and she's trying to act like the man. There's, I believe there was people that took her and shaved her head and made her an example to the people. You're not supposed to, the feminism, zero tolerance for feminism. All right. But that's what that's talking about. And then Philippians 3.19 is where you get that whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Philippians 3.19 but once again, today you shave a woman's head, they just glorify it. This is cool. I've seen women that have half their head shaved. Sisters in Christ, for you to be in right standing with God, you need to be able to comb your hair down on all sides, and it comes down and covers your head, all the way down to the shoulders, and you can't see your head. Just err on the side of caution. That's guaranteed. That's what you need to do. If you, There's women that shave half their head, so this half of the head has a cover, talking about the hair, and this half doesn't. I've seen them shave their hair completely, have mohawks. I've seen a lot of here with these elderly women here, it just, it was before my generation, and I'm going to get ahead of myself, um, we're almost done, brothers and sisters, but 
the, uh, somehow a few generations ago they started pushing the elderly to cut their hair short, the women to cut their hair short. And now today the average elderly woman, I'd have to say 80 to 90 percent of them, have short haircuts. They have manly haircuts. Well, it's easy to take care of in my, own age, in my old age. Are we supposed to be pleasing God or pleasing ourselves? Are we supposed to be taking the easy path or the narrow path? The easy path is usually likened to the wide, the broad path that leads to destruction, if you know what I'm talking about. But we're supposed to be doing things God's way, and sometimes it takes a lot, it, it, not sometimes, a lot of times it's going to take a little bit more work, but we don't care because we're all about pleasing God and doing things God's way. Amen. Another verse for that, if you were to shave a feminist woman's hair today, they would just glor glory in it, glorify it, is Proverbs 3.35. When you turn to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 35, we read, The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion, promotion of fools. When you have someone who glorifies in their shame, they're promoting their shame, that's a fool. That's a lost person. You have some brethren acting foolish. They're glorifying a, something that they should be ashamed of. They're acting foolish. They're acting like a lost person. But it says here, the wise shall inherit wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And this is the whole duty of man, to keep God's, uh, fear God and keep His commandments. Fearing God and keeping His commandments, that's where real wisdom is where it's always been. Okay. Matthew 15, 14 says, so I've quoted Matthew 14, uh, 15, let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind, and the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. Brother says Christ, what's the, is this how the world's running today, in this order? No. Now I don't want to have to erase everything, but I could, but you know what the world does today, Brother says Christ, and we see it. Grace Jesus Christ, Erase Jesus Christ, erase God the Father, they take God out of it completely, and it goes in backwards order. The children have all the power and authority today. The parents cannot raise their children in the admonition of the Lord today because the governments and everything, they're doing everything they can to make the children their own head coverings, their own power and authority. You look at in the, in the, in the uh, schools. When I meant by when they erased, when you erased Jesus Christ, you erased God the Father and Jesus Christ, what did they do? They took prayer out of schools. They took the Ten Commandments out of schools. They took the Ten Commandments out of our government. They took prayer out of the government. They took God completely out of the equation. When they did that, what did they do? They went after the children. You're your own boss. They taught the children to rebel against the parents. They messed up the, the children. They were no longer being raised, women to be women, and men to be men. They were told not to follow their parents, not to grow up to be like the daughters were taught not to be like their mothers. The sons were taught not to be like their fathers. We want a whole new generation where the men act like women and the women act like men. They hit the children first, and the children today have all the authority. They have more authority than the man or the woman. Once they messed up generation after generation, they got that messed up. They were able to bring in feminism hardcore, and they messed the women up second. Now the women of today, it's hardcore feminism. With the children messed up and the women messed up, then it was easy to get the men messed up. Men don't want to be head coverings. Men don't want to do things God's way. And they need to. They need to do their best to do the things God's way. There's no justification, but you see the order of it. How they messed everything up. They went backwards. They, they erased God, got rid of God. They got rid of the fear of God. That's what Satan does. And he gets rid of God's commandments. Yea, hath God said. It's no longer God's way. The children can live however they want to live. They can do what, what, what feels good. If it feels good, do it. And the children, they took away the head covering for the children. Then they took away the head covering for the women. Then you got the men. Okay. In Revelation 2.20 it says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou severest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. 
that calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And this last day we have the Jezebel spirit. And the Jezebel spirit today is what's in the world today. One more verse, Isaiah 3.12. Sorry for being so long. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. You got that feminist spirit today, and this, uh, the Jezebel spirit, which is the feminist spirit. Oops. I went too far. Isaiah 3, 12. It says, As for my people, children are their oppressors. And women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. God's way. You got people coming in, messing up the children. And then messing up the women. And then messing up the men. In that order. We see it everywhere, brother, says Christ. Now, Brethren, is it possible to still have this life, do things God's way today? I believe it is. Is it easy? No. It is not easy, brother, says Christ. In these last days, it is hard. Now, I don't have all the answers. Okay, as far as I don't know how God can make this happen in your life, but I'm not going to limit God. All I'm going to say is pray hard, brother, says Christ. Pray, pray, pray hard for this. Make sure you're doing your best to be a Proverbs 31 woman. Do it, being a woman in the boundary that God has set for you. Being a Proverbs 31 for the men out there, brothers in Christ, that you're doing your best to be a Proverbs 31 man, even as a single man. You're doing your best to be able to do everything that God has commanded a man to do. Okay? One of the things is, is, is brothers in Christ out there, if you can't afford to take care of a wife, then you don't get married. If you can't afford to take care of a wife and children, you don't get married. And you don't fornicate. The Bible's against fornication. You save that from marriage. Okay? You don't have sex outside of marriage, in other words. If you can't afford to take care of one, work hard, pray to the Lord until God opens doors to where you can afford to take care of one. Then you get married. I know a brother in Christ who jumped the gun. And he tried to use that as an excuse. Um, what is it? If, if a man provide not for his own, he's worse than an infidel. He couldn't afford to take care of a wife, yet he got married anyway. That's not how you're supposed to do it. Right? But you pray, brothers of Christ. You pray hard and you work hard, doing good works according to the Bible. Taking this book, hiding your heart, and you're living it, and God will open doors for you. God will open doors for you. Sisters of Christ looking for head coverings, God will open doors for you. Now, I'm sorry for this study going so long, but I really wanted to push it that this is not talking about this. 1 Corinthians. Okay? 1 Corinthians... Uh, 11 verses 1 through 15. It's not talking about a physical head covering as far as this. Right? It's talking about having a man as a head covering for the women. And men are not to have women as their head covering. Jesus Christ is supposed to be their head. Jesus Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of every woman. The woman is to have a man as a head covering. A man is not supposed to have a woman as a head covering. This is the Bible way, brother says Christ. So I'm going to end this real quick with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next study. I love my brother and sister Christ. I'm praying for you. Keep praying for me. And I'll see you in another video.